Hello and welcome to the Geeks Review. I'm Royce. I'm Paige. I'm Matt. And today we're reviewing the Artemis Fowl movie, which just premiered on the streaming service Disney+. Plus. This is based upon the children's book series created by Owen Colfer about a young criminal genius interacting with the world of fantasy, fairies, magic and mystery. This movie has been in production in some form or another for nearly 20 years and finally it has reached us, directed by Kenneth Branagh and starring among a plethora of young child actors, Josh Gad, Judi Dench and Colin Farrell. However, this film has been given a somewhat lukewarm reception by the fans and critics alike. With us today we have a new person to the show, Matt. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Royce. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> now, you are a uh, passionate Artemis Fowl fan. Yes. I, I didn't read them when they first came out in 2001 because I was three, but when I was <laughs> 12, so about, yeah. you know, literally 10 years ago, I actually did start reading the books and I've basically been waiting for this film for 10 years and... I'm really sad. So yeah, do you want to go a little bit into what the film or what the book series is and what it should have been before we get to the film itself? Since sure. you're the expert here, I've sure. done sure. my research, but yeah, sure. Uh, um, thank you for recognising my my importance in this in this in this endeavour. So the books are a commentary on greed and environmentalism and humanity and xenophobia and. It's really interesting and different, especially for the time, because Artemis Fowl in the books is a terrible person to start with. Not outrageously terrible, he doesn't kill anyone or cause any permanent damage, but... So essentially, Artemis Fowl is a rich, autistic criminal genius, right? <laughs> he comes from a long line of criminal masterminds. And at the start of the first book, his father has gone missing and his mother has gone mad. Locked herself away in the attic, hasn't she? Yes, she has. She locked herself in the attic and went mad. So Artemis's only uh, company is his enormous bodyguard, Butler, and Butler's sister, Juliet. Mm, sister, yes. Yeah. Sister. In his efforts to find his father, he discovers that fairies are real. and they, But they're not the fairies we know. Generally, they have advanced technology and the police force and they're hiding from the humans because humans are terrible. This is oh, important. Yes. <laughs> we'll come to this later. They're hiding from humans because humans are terrible and the, they would be no match for the humans. Even though they have superior technology, there's just too many humans. Hmm. I think that's the same as Harry Potter and the, yeah. the muggles versus wizards thing. Like the, muggle, the wizards are more powerful, but the muggles would overwhelm them. Hmm. Um, so it's kind of similar, but... Artemis's plan is he's going to kidnap a fairy and then hold them to ransom to get literal leprechaun gold hmm. to fund his search for his father. But so it's interesting that Artemis's um, love for his father does motivate everything he does, but it's because he respects his father as his criminal superior and he doesn't remember him as a loving father. He just wants to get him back because it's a slight against his family. It's pride. Mm. So Artemis kidnaps a police officer from the lower elements police reconnaissance squad or LEP recon or leprechaun. <laughs> um, oh, wow. He, kidnap he yeah. kidnaps her and holds her to ransom in his house. Her name's Holly Short and uh, there's a whole big shenanigans that ensue. The LEP recon come up and put the foul house in a time freeze and... They're like, oh, well, we're fairies. We can take we can take this kid, but Artemis is too smart and too ruthless and too cunning, and he <laughs> outwits them at every turn. At the end of the book, he actually he, he wins, and none of the fairies really like him. But he does develop a little bit through the book from being a terrible criminal to a somewhat decent person, and he gets his ton of gold. But before letting Holly go, he makes a deal with her that he'll give her and the LEP half the gold back if she uses her magic to cure his mother. And that's the end of the book. He's developed a little bit, and we have room for the sequels. So it's quite an interesting premise for a kid's book. I mean, to have a, a, almost a villainous character, an antagonist as the lead role, mm. quite complex thematically and, I guess, morally complex. It leads to, uh, I guess, some questioning from the kids who would have read it to go like, okay, so he's not exactly the best person. Can we root for him? Oh, we can. We can. I guess that's the kind of you know, the kind of feeling you got as a kid when you read it. 
Yeah, well, I think in some ways, because Artemis sees himself as better than everyone else, and mm. the worst part is he is better than everyone else. Yes. But I think in some way, at some point, every kid before puberty hits and you doubt everything you stand for, I think every kid does think that way. Like, they know best. They know what's right. And so they see Artemis do that and, like, start to get away with it. And they're like, oh, I love this guy. This is who <laughs> I can be. But then... Artemis gets his come up and he starts developing and seeing his own flaws and those kids could see their own flaws staring back at them and perhaps grow up with Artemis. So for such a morally complex book, you have a movie which is uh, less, to say the least. Oh, wow. Yes. So uh, in, in, in the film, uh, you, you've seen it. Yes, yeah, so sorry. I'll give a bit of a rundown. It's essentially the same plot, except there is a MacGuffin mm-hmm. thrown in there. Artemis himself isn't so much of a criminal mastermind as a genius kid who's a bit of a jerk, kind of suffering from the Benedict Cumberbatch Sherlock, you know, <laughs> disease yeah. which has struck geniuses the last yeah. decade. And he's really quite cocky and sure of himself. Mm. But he didn't know much about his, I guess, his family's... Criminal. I mean, they're not really criminals in this thing. There's kind of a suggestion that they're they're burglars, they're robbers, but they're not like quite a criminal, you know, mastermind or a, or a crime family, in the way it seems like the book has set them out to be. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so in this version, Artemis Fowl Senior, played by Colin Farrell, who mm. I'm just going to say at the start, none of the film is the actor's fault. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think everyone does a good job for what they've got. For what but- they're given. So yeah. Colin Farrell, he's Colin Farrell, you know. Yeah. Artemis Fowl Sr., his father, who is missing in the first book. You don't see him till the second book mm. when Artemis, you know, actually goes and rescues him and has more character development. But no, you see, uh, you see Artemis Sr. a lot in, in, in this film. And Artemis Sr. has been protecting the humans from the fairies. Mm. Well particularly bad fairies, but still. So straight away, we lose this message that humans are the bad guys. Yeah. Straight away, we lose that interesting notion and and comment. And they've also added uh, the character of Beechwood, who is Holly's father. Holly Short, the girl that the... The the fairy. Fairy girl. The fairy. 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 (laughs) Fairy. The fairy girl. No, the fairy girl. The fairy cop. The fairy cop that he kidnaps. They've added a father character who you don't meet, so... Yeah. Kind of cringe. Um, <laughs> they've added this father figure who worked with Artemis Fowl Sr. to hide the Aculos, which is... The MacGuffin. The MacGuffin. The... It's just... It's literally described as a weapon too powerful to fall into either hands. You know, it's... it's yeah, it's... it's... But it's, it's, it's not really defined what it is. Um, no, it isn't, no. So they've added Holly, given her a father, to relate to Artemis more. I mean... We see their relationship develop in the books without that, just fine, but whatever. So what all this means is that Artemis did not discover the fairies on his own. He gets shown it by the but- the butler character. By the butler. butler. Oh, and, and, and <laughs> the butler, butler in the books is a servant who, over time, becomes a friend to Artemis. Yeah. There's a sense in the first book that they actually don't even like each other. Really? Yeah, um, in the film, Artemis calls Butler Dom, short for Domovoy, which is his name. But you don't find that out till the third book, when it's a big moment, when he thinks he's going to die, he tells Artemis his name. Right, so they've just skipped all character development. Because yes. the thing, because they say he is the butler, he's called Butler, but mm. don't call him the butler. They yeah. make a big deal about that through... The narration, there's quite a lot of that throughout this entire mm. film where it's like, here's this big character defining moment which fleshes out the world but comes into play at no point because mm-hmm. they go and make a big deal, don't call him the butler. Mm. That's obviously going to be a part where Josh Gad's dwarf c- comes into it and he calls him, oh, the butler over there. And he goes, oh, don't call me butler. But that doesn't happen. No, it doesn't happen. No, it doesn't happen. Um, <laughs> there's lots of stuff that comes up in the film that is not, fleshed out later like Mm. butler's niece in the film rather than sister juliet who has been aged down so when she was she was given a big introduction too. josh gad was like butler needed to bring in uh someone 
who understood martial arts and defense like he did, but also knew the mind of a 12-year-old boy. His niece, Juliet. So it's like, oh, cool, she's going to be a character. And then she's in there for about 10 shots. Yeah, she's probably in that introduction more than she is the rest of the film. Yes, yeah, she is. Uh, in the book, she's older than Artemis. She's She works in the house and helps with the criminal escapades hmm. um, and has funny interactions with Holly while she's you know kidnapped. When they introduced her as a 12-year-old in the film, I was like, okay, a love interest for Artemis. But they don't even do that. They don't even do that. I mean, I'm glad they didn't do that. <laughs> yeah, there is thankfully none of that. Why did it happen? Also, the film is only 90 minutes long. It feels really quick, but also really long at the same time. <laughs> there's like po- there's moments where it feels like they've gone and cut out the pauses in characters' dialogues, so there's no dramatic it emphasis where it's just like, Artemis Fowl, you're a criminal mastermind and we're going to get you. It's not like, it is, it's like really just it, it, sped up. It's really quick and it goes... But drags. <laughs> it, bl- it, bl- it glosses over all the character stuff. Like I mentioned before, they added the character of Beechwood, Holly's father, who you never meet. Mm. But rather than, rather than Holly and Artemis parting on shaky ground, but with kind of a respect for each other, like they do in the book. Mm. In the film, they have a discussion about both their fathers working together Mm. and that's okay. And there's a great scene in the book where Holly outsmarts Artemis and escapes and comes all the way up to his safe house and he's acting cocky the whole time because he's outsmarted everyone this whole time. But Holly just gets a good punch in. She punches him in the face. And it's an amazing moment in the book. It's so... Cathartic. Even though you're rooting for Artemis, you're really rooting for Holly, and she punches him in the face like, "Oh hell yeah!" But <laughs> in the film, it's like our fathers work together. I need your help. Can I trust you? Hang on. Punches him in the face. Now you can trust me. <laughs> That's just one of the moments that gets butchered by, yeah. by the film. The, the film butchers the source material, and I'm okay. I just want to say that I'm okay. I understand that when you adapt something for a film from a book or from from anything. When you adapt something, sometimes you have to make changes to mm. make it work better. But as long as you stay true to the heart of the story, the the Stephen King's It films. Have you talked about those on the show? No, we haven't. No, no. that'd be that'd be good meat for the discussion at some. We point. We did actually do an episode last week about uh, compromise versus inspiration in regards to comic book adaptations, such as with Batman versus Superman, which took inspiration from like four different comics, yeah. and the Watchmen film, which was one source, which trimmed a lot of the fat on that and just focused on the main story. Yeah. And I think with this, do you think you probably could have fit like a really loyal adaptation of the, the first novel within that 90 minutes of the film if they'd disregarded all the MacGuffin or the additional stuff? It would have been hard. Mm. Um, the, books aren't, the, act, the book's only nine chapters long. Mm. They're, they're fat chapters, but yeah. they're, it, it, it's actually not that long. It's a pretty concise story. 90 minutes is very quick. Yeah. 90 I I I mean I don't know why they didn't go to 2 hours. I okay. don't know why. I don't understand that cuz and also as a fan of the book, do you remember when the first teaser came out in November 2018? Uh no. Oh, I don't. But you first go on. teaser came out in 2018 and I was watching that and of course none of those shots are in the film. Um, yeah, I've heard there's apparently some deleted scenes on Disney Plus. Okay. Well, so, uh, which I'll are all fully rendered, those. I think. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I have to look, have a look at those. I haven't looked at those. I'm just, I don't want to touch it again. But um, <laughs> staying away. <laughs> yeah, staying away. When I watched that trailer, I instantly recognised it as the opening from the book, which is where Artemis has already discovered the fairies, and he and Butler have gone to Vietnam because they've tracked down an above ground sprite. Hmm. And when I was watching. The trailer, I was like, that's awesome. That yeah. looks how I imagined it. Like, there was not much dialogue. There was just, like, a creepy voiceover. But I was like, wow, this is going to be cool. Like, I recognise what scene that is. And also, everything in the film looked exactly how I imagined it. Yeah, I was going to ask about that because there is kind of, like, a fantasy future element to yeah. a lot of the, the fairy technology, mm. especially. Like, they've gone and got all these, these flying ships, which... They're, they've reminded me a lot of like something from like maybe Aliens or Avatar, James Cameron's Avatar. Mm. It's not like, you know, super advanced Star Trek or Star Wars, but it is kind of in that, that realm. And I was sort of thinking, is this just, have they cheaped out on that? How accurate is that to the book? 
And when I did go back and look at a bit of like a, a plot synopsis of the mm. novel, they do talk about how the fairy, the fairy community is quite technologically advanced in comparison to humans, but still not, you know, light years ahead. Mm. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's and that that's one of the things that's so interesting about the book. And something a book can do that a film can't do is in a monologue. One film I saw where they tried to do in a monologue was the uh, Dune film. Uh, have right. you seen that? No, I haven't. No, but w- there's so many characters. They they obviously tried to verbatim produce the book, and so you have characters like looking at something, and there's just an echoey voiceover yeah. talking about what they're thinking, and it just sucks. Yes. <laughs> um. So I understand why that doesn't happen, but in the book, you go into the characters' mindsets and what they're thinking, and all their actions make sense. And they talk about the fairy technology, like the nuclear batteries, and and all this kind of stuff. And that's part of the stuff that's so interesting about Artemis Fowl. The book is the world building. It's so it's so clear mm. and it's so it makes sense too. Yeah. Like obviously you have to suspend your disbelief here and there, but it all makes sense and it it's 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 really interesting. Um and in the film it looks how I imagined it to look. Uh, I love how it looked. Like if 12-year-old me had just seen stills from the film, he would have been like fine, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I was fine looking at the stills, but the rich explanation from the book just isn't there. Yeah, because I guess you've had a lot of sort of urban fantasy stuff which has come out in the last 20 or so years. Mm. God, so many just films I couldn't even name. But I was reminded of a lot of those, and I guess because this... Artemis Fowl did come first as a book yeah, and maybe sort of set the template, set the groundwork... It's kind of like with The Matrix because that took a lot of inspiration from, you know, anime and manga, like, you know, Ghost Mm. in the Shell. Mm. And then when you go and get the Ghost in the Shell live action film. It feels like The Matrix. It feels like The Matrix, yeah. Yeah. So I was wondering if it was kind of a symptom of that and how well that translated, but that seems to have been one Mm. (laughs) saving grace of this film. Yeah, everything looks great. Um, I guess an art book would be appreciated, like a concept art book. Yeah. From this. Um, there, were, there were several graphic novels released based on... I did see that, yeah. Um, and the characters look so ugly in those. <laughs> so ugly. Like, Butler's neck is thicker than his head. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a style, but yeah. Yeah, I did hear that the character of Holly was described as being, like, nuttish or something in, like, the, the colour of her skin. Yeah, um, I hair. remember original fan castings called for like Halle Berry That's, um, yeah. to play. And I, I don't think Halle Berry would have been good at the character. Yeah, yeah. Cause I mean, this has been in production for like nearly 20 years. Yeah. Owen Colfer, the author of the book has in interviews said he loved some of the changes so much that he might re-release the books with the changes incorporated. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I mean, you know, go off sis, whatever, but it's <laughs> so just, long as the originals are still, yes, available. as long as the yeah. originals are still there. Don't do the George Lucas and, yeah. Wipe them from history. Exactly, yeah. Should we talk about actors? Yeah. Is it just me or does it feel like they kind of wanted like, you know, Asa Butterfield as, you know, as Artemis and they wanted like a Maisie Williams type for Holly? Ten years ago, Asa Butterfield was the top fan choice Yeah. to play the role. Oh, yeah. I saw heaps of heaps of fan art of him yeah. in um, the role. I would have loved that. I think Ferdia, Ferdia, Ferdia Shaw, who, who played Artemis, he wasn't the strongest because i remember fairly early on because like like we said earlier he doesn't really know that his dad is a criminal at all and i mean the whole criminal element is brought down i was kind of thinking like is this you know take people in the back of alleys and you know cap them in the head (laughs) is it that kind of you know criminal empire they've got going here or is it just with this it just seems to be like he's just robbing from you know museums and stuff and doing that sort of stuff but even that's not really fully explained and with this artemis has no idea and he goes on a bit of like uh where's my dad you know where have you taken my dad and he's all screaming and then butler goes like well actually artemis here's this big secret your father's been hiding and then he immediately he immediately just like goes like oh yeah fine i'm i'm cool with this Hmm. And then at the end, he's all like, I'm a criminal mastermind. And you're like, what have you done? done? Yeah, what have you done? (laughs) He hasn't done anything. He didn't even hold Holly for ransom. No, he just kidnapped her because she was there. And Yeah, and and then he was like, I need you to help me find the Aculos. And he had it the whole time. Ferdia Shaw, the actor, I don't think he was strong enough for the role. I mean, it wasn't written very well. I said very early on, he sort of does the whole Cumberbatch, you know. Yeah, which is the character of Artemis. Do you think if he'd been like that through the entire thing or was that sort of a bit too stiff? I wonder, because 
you can't tell a lot of the time. But because in that first scene where he was um, psychoanalyzing his therapist, mm. um, that's from the second book. I think with that, is that an incident though, which is a really sort of character defining for Artemis? Because he knows sometimes they can chop and change. But it's interesting, like you talked about, sorry to cut you off, but um, with, with adaptation, how it seems all these other films just sort of get butchered in the adaptation process. Mm. But some like Twilight and Harry Potter sort of get away scot free. Mm. But it would kind of be like if they went and chucked something from the Chamber of Secrets in the Philosopher's Stone, if they were to do that film adaptation now. When I was reading the books when I was 12, Owen Colfer, and and there were, you know, forums and Owen Colfer was talking Mm. about the film being in development. (laughs) Even 10 years ago, they said, yes, the first film is going to be the first two books. Mm. Like even 10 years ago. And I was like, right, okay. I mean, I didn't think about it that much as a kid. I was like, oh, okay, well, I guess that's fewer films, whatever. But I just want to film. But they're both so important. And as we've seen, like this film is mostly just the first book, but it it rushes through everything. Hmm. A- and the, the therapist scene, which I, what I was going to say is Ferdy Ashore is okay in that scene. And I started to see Artemis that I knew from the books in that scene. Hmm. But then he went surfing. And, yeah. and then he was on a hoverboard. And, oh, yeah, he and was actually. He, yeah. and, then he, and, then he, and then he like expressed love for his dad. And yeah. then he called his manservant by his first name and was sad. And his mum's just completely disney fired, just taken out and killed. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Obviously, they're not looking to make sequels because the mum becomes really important in the sequels. What? It just baffles me. Like, it just feels like they have been making the film for so long and they just wanted to cash in on the rights they'd held on to for so long and, and just get something out, no matter what it was, with no... Because everyone's in the fran- in the market of uh, franchise building. Yeah. They're just going to have to write new movies now. Like, everything's going to be new. Like, the stories are tried and tested. They're so- everyone loves them from the books. Everyone loves them. Yeah. Uh, but why did they feel they had to change it so much? Did they think that parents wouldn't want their kids to see a criminal? I, I just don't get it. They could have done it in such a way which sort of had you doubting, you know? like I mean, they could have just marketed it as like, oh, you know, oh, he's the new hero. He's the new Harry Potter for the time. And then just gone like into the film like, oh, no, he is a criminal. He is a devious, you know, so-and-so. Well, I, I actually kind of hoped... Because I had a theory that um, the Sonic movie, well, my friend had a theory that they never um, actually rendered the whole film with the original Sonic design Mm. and they actually did it properly from the get-go and made a bad trailer (laughs) to get publicity. That would have been, yeah. Um, It worked. (laughs) um, my, My friend had that theory and I think it's great. And so I kind of applied it to this going in. I was like, okay, because the trailers were just appalling. As soon as... And this shot actually didn't end up in the film, but in the trailer, the second trailer, not the first one, which I loved, but the second one, there's a shot with Holly... Mulch, the Josh Gad character, and Butler, like, lined up. And Mulch goes, I'm the dwarf who worked with your father. And Holly goes, and I'm Holly Short, your friend on the other side. And then they shake hands. That oh, that made me tear my eyes out when I saw it. Uh, of course, um, it's all just a marketing thing to go like, oh, here's yeah. the characters here to get you familiar. And But it, it's still sort of that, Yeah, you know? I thought maybe they were advertising it like he was some generic hero. And then it was going to be like, ha-ha. Not only did Artemis trick the fairies, but we, Disney, have tricked you. I was like, oh, please, please. And then in the film, they actually started to do the scene where Artemis kidnapped Holly. And I was like, oh, okay, we're getting back on track. But it was still hot garbage. I noticed something about the introduction to the film where you have the character of Mulch, a dwarf, a, a mm. tall dwarf, a giant dwarf. Oh, played don't by... get me started on Dwarfus <laughs> Gigantus. Just cast a short actor. Played by Josh Gad. Uh, Olaf from Frozen. He's hauled in for interrogation and he begins to tell the story of the film through narration. And I was reminded of the video game Dragon Age 2, which begins with a dwarf being hauled in for interrogation and telling the story of the film. An American accented dwarf as well, <laughs> with the same sort of gruff voice. I'm like, that they just ripping off from Dragon Age 2 here. It's like it's Varric Tethras all over again. That's funny. It, it was amusing. I, like I said, I've, I've, I sort of went into this and I'd heard about Artemis Fowl, you know, over mm. the years. Never read it, never really knew what it was about before this. So I kind of approached it as a film and... I think it is a bit jankily made. Oh, even as a... If you ignore the adaptation, it's also a bad film. Yeah, I think as a kid, maybe if I'd seen it, maybe I could have gone like, oh, there's parts of this I liked. Let's check out the books. What the hell? Mm. This is completely different. Why is he a villain? 
why is he a bad guy? Mm. Would that have turned me off as a kid? Maybe I was a stupid kid. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it would get its fans, but hopefully if it does get any fans who want to then read the books, they then pick up the books and then go, this is so much better. Yeah. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Often that doesn't happen. I mean, if they don't like the film, they won't read the book. But mm. if they like the film, the book will be different. Yeah. And they, that's how I would have been when I was a kid. I saw the Harry Potter films first and then I read the books and they actually introduced Malfoy without naming him in the books, I think. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, Which is really So I, ima- I built up a character, you know, like you meant to. I built up the character reading the introduction of Malfoy and I was like, oh, I wonder who this kid is. He sounds interesting. And then when they name dropped him as Malfoy, I had like a couple of minutes of cognitive dissonance <laughs> and I had to morph this character I'd built into Tom Felton. Wow, yeah. yeah. Even I've recently listened to the podcast where they're reading out the first Harry Potter book live as part of the lockdown. Yeah. When they began to read about the scene in the robe shop mm. where... Draco is speaking with Harry for the first time, but he's not named. It took me a minute to realise it was Draco. Yeah. Because he's not even described overly as you see Tom Felton in the movies. So it took me a minute and then I was like, hang on, this is this is Malfoy. And I had to go back and listen to it again. And I went, that's a bit strange. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it is interesting because I'm old and I did partially read or have the books read to me before the film. Mm-hmm. So I did kind of have this sort of just generic image in my head of, you know, what mm. Draco should look like. And mm. I can't actually reconcile the, the movie versions with the book versions. Mm. Like I find it very difficult to imagine Daniel Radcliffe. And Emma Watson and all the other... I I just can't get over it. I haven't read it in 10 years, though. But to wrap up for this film, (laughs) Artemis Fowl, it's released to Disney+, Plus, so you don't have to go to the cinemas. This was going to be a cinematic release, but now it's... I would have liked to have gone to the cinema with a bunch of people and cried about it. (laughs) Really? Just wasted your money on it? It wouldn't be a waste if you were friends. (laughs) That's true. (laughs) But you've got to watch it from the comfort of your own home and cry openly. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> what is this? As a film, it's a bit janky, but it's no different from any other sort of film like this. But it's just a, it's a sad trend, I guess, you know, first mm-hmm. Percy Jackson and now this. Mm. Just another in the long line of, why did Twilight get the decent one? <laughs> Twilight actually tried to improve upon the books I and suppose. places. I suppose. I haven't yeah. even covered everything that I think about the film, so... But anyway, that's been our uh, ramble review of Artemis Fowl. <laughs> You can watch it, but don't, maybe. Go read the books. Read the book. Pick it up from the library. Yeah. Buy it from wherever you buy your books from. Disney books. Anyway, this has been the Geeks Review. I'm Royce. I'm Paige. I'm Matt. And we'll see you next time. Bye for now. <laughs>